uh, and I'm presenting today a paper called Specification Requirement and the Diffusion of Technology during the 18th Century. The status and footing of patent law during the first half of the 18th century is extremely obscure. The first researcher to work on the subject was Ed Edward Hume over a century ago, since when it has only been revisited by Christine MacLeod. More is known about the development of patent law in the second half of the 18th century, thanks to the efforts of MacLeod, Harold Dutton, and more recently, Helen Guppy. The aim of this paper is to look back at this murkier period and to see how it might inform our current understanding of subsequent developments in patent law. It is particularly concerned with investigating the introduction of the specification and how it influenced the legal construction of patents. The specification was a detailed written description of the patented invention. It had to be deposited at the Court of Chancery within a predetermined time limit after the patent had been granted. The specification was introduced in the first half of the 18th century, and there is some debate as to the reasons why. Hume argued that the specification was introduced at the request of inventors applying for patents. They were apparently concerned that their patent would be preempted by another party pirating their invention before they had secured protection. To maintain secrecy, applicants requested that they only provide a description of the invention after the patent had been sealed. An agreement was made with the law officers that if the inventor failed to enter such a description, that they would forfeit their patent. In contrast to Hume, Christine MacLeod suggests that the specification was introduced on the initiative of the law officers. Uh, the law officers were responsible for deciding whether or not the patent should be granted. And it was, it was introduced to help them discriminate between ostensibly similar inventions. Limited to the role of administrative arbiter, MacLeod argues that the specification was of limited legal significance in the first half of the 18th century. Because the specification was so unimportant, MacLeod claims that wherever it was in their interests, patentees would enter intentionally misleading descriptions so that they could retain an element of secrecy about their invention. Also, no official efforts were made to use the specification as a means of disseminating the invention. To consult a specification, a party had to search the chancery offices in which it could have been entered. Substantial fees were levied for obtaining copies and, to protect their income, chancery officers prohibited visitors from writing personal extracts. Such were the difficulties involved with consulting specifications. MacLeod claims that it was quite feasible for a patentee to work his patent in secrecy until reform to the patent system in 1852. The legal status of the specification is thought to have changed later in the 18th century with Lord Mansfield's decision in Lyadette versus Johnson in 1778. Apparently, for the first time, an inventor lost his patent due to the insufficiency of his specification. The specification was now apparently a binding instrument on which the legality of the patent was dependent. This was because the specification was now seen to be the vehicle by which the public were to be informed of the invention and the consideration on which the patent was granted. MacLeod again writes, for the first time, the recognized quid pro quo for the award of a patent was the disclosure of the invention. This sudden change in the purpose of the specification placed patentees in a vulnerable position. They could not have anticipated that the specification would become such an important document. Further, patentees were slow to adapt to the exacting criteria with which the judiciary assessed the sufficiency of the specification. The situation was compounded by the prohibition of amendments to the specification once it had been entered. Conceiving the patent and the specification in this manner represents a significant conceptual development concerning invention and intellectual property. Mario Biagioli argues that it is with the written requirement that there is a movement away from patents as early modern privileges to patents as intellectual property rights. Uh, and this slide, very, very, very briefly, 
uh, presents, presents a schema for distinguishing between a system of early modern privileges and modern intellectual property rights. In a system of privileges, the consideration on which the patent is awarded is one of utility. So the second point here. And it's important that the invention is considered to be of direct economic benefit, however that might be defined. In contrast, in a system of intellectual property rights, these direct utility requirements are minimal. And it is with the introduction of the specification that the consideration on the grant is supposed to change. So this comes down to the fourth point here. Now the patent is awarded for disclosing the invention via the specification. Biagioli claims that this rationale underpins any modern intellectual property rights regime, claiming it is the specification requirement that makes the patent system defensible in political terms. This causes something of a problem for the orthodox interpretation of the specification. It would be strange that such an important conceptual development in the patent would occur without any kind of institutional or jurisprudential precedent. The first half of this paper will look at the introduction and development of the specification in the first half of the 18th century. Using contemporary law officer reports, it will argue that the specification had replaced utility and the public good as the consideration on which the patent was awarded sometime before 1778. Consequently, the accuracy of the specification was a consideration in law before Lyadette versus Johnson. This also implies that England had begun to move towards a system of modern intellectual property rights earlier than has been previously supposed. The second half of the talk will explore some of the implications of this doctrine, both before and after the apparent change of Lyadette. Importantly, if inventors wanted an enforceable patent, they were compelled to be diligent in their production of the specification. Although the specifications produced might not be regarded today as particularly accurate or useful, uh, and I'll be showing you an example of a technical drawing from the first half of the 18th century, technical drawings and terminology remained rudimentary until the last quarter of the 18th century. Despite this, though, they were regularly consulted by contemporaries. So then, there are, there are a few instances of specifications being produced in the 17th century, although the specification submitted by John Naismith for his 1711 patent is regarded as the first proper. For the next two decades, the specification was not a universal requirement. Between 1711 and 1733, specifications were only ordered, only ordered on about one in six patents. In the following decade, however, specifications were ordered on almost all patents, and thereafter it became mandatory. In the English application for a patent, it was the law officers who decided both whether or not a patent ought to be granted, and also decided whether or not a specification would be required. In their earliest reports, when ordering a specification, it was on the ground suggested by Hume, i.e. to protect the invention until the patent was sealed. And here we have a few examples uh, of some extracts from law officer reports. So on Naismith's reports, the first where a specification was ordered, the law officer reported, the petitioner thinks it not safe to specify in what the new invention consists, but proposes that so soon as the patent shall be passed, the same shall be by him ascertained under his hand and seal to be enrolled in the High Court of Chancery. And we can see here a similar reasoning behind the order for John Kay's 1732 patent. With time, however, this rationale begins to disappear from the reports of the law officers and is replaced with another. Increasingly, the law officers regarded the description of the invention contained in the petition to be insufficient. In these cases, the law officer would state in his report that the petitioner had to enter a specification as a condition of the patent. For example, in 1734, the Attorney General reported, in regard the petitioner has not fully described the nature of his invention, it will be proper that a clause should be inserted in his patent to oblige him to describe it more fully by an instrument in writing to be enrolled in the High Court of Chancery. There are some instances where the law officers on their own initiative demanded fuller descriptions before 1734, but it is later, in the second half of the 1730s, 
when the specification starts to become mandatory that this latter wording, this latter wording comes to dominate. It is clear then that the law officers sought fuller descriptions of inventions from patentees than had been hitherto provided in the petition. Further, from the 1730s, the specification was required from almost every patentee. This, however, only moves the description back one stage, the explanation back one stage. Why did the law officers decide to demand fuller descriptions? McLeod suggested it may have been to assist them in discriminating between petitions for ostensibly similar inventions. This may well have been part of the reason. Some reports do refer to the need for distinguishing between the invention for which a patent was sought uh, and the current state of the art. But the problem with this explanation is that the law officers were hardly inundated with petitions between which they had to distinguish. In the 33 years it took for the specification to become mandatory, just over 200 patents were awarded, less than seven a year. Perhaps more tellingly, the specification also became a requirement for the patent in Ireland and Scotland at the same time. Yet in the first half of the 18th century, only six patents were awarded in Ireland and only two in Scotland. So there simply can't have been the need to distinguish between patents in the manner suggested by MacLeod. This resurrects the possibility that the specification became mandatory because it was intended to act as a means of disseminating patented invention and that it became the consideration on which the patent was awarded. If we go back to this quickly, um, on the second point of the public good being the consideration of the patents, that clearly declines uh, in the first half of the 18th century. Um, and this trend can be clearly seen in the Hardwick papers by comparing the reports of the first Earl, who was a law officer between 1720 and 1733, with those of his second son, who was a law officer some 30 years later. The reports of the first Earl were often very extensive, and petitions were rejected if an invention was not considered to be in the public interest to encourage. For example, in 1728, the petition of Nicholas Mandel for his invention for improved tallow candles, was rejected on the recommendation of the excise commissioners because the duty on tallow candles is one penny per pound and on those made of wax, eight pence per pound. And if the candles made after his new method should be used instead of wax, it will prevent the consumption of wax candles and lessen the revenue in proportion. Another consideration of importance was the balance of payments and trade. Lord Hardwick noted approvingly of William Houghton's petition for a new method of producing sodium carbonate that it would save considerable sums of money sent abroad to purchase the said commodities from the Baltic and elsewhere. In contrast, 30 years later, the reports of his son are formulaic and cursory. He never considers whether the invention would be in the public interest, however defined, and he never forwards a petition to another government body such as the excise commissioners, which his father commonly did. By the 1760s, then, the public good had disappeared as a criterion by which a patent was granted. It also had also disappeared as a legal consideration. Later, in Arkwright versus Nightingale in 1785, defence counsel attempted to argue against Arkwright's patent because, by the statute against monopolies, no patent is to prevail that is generally inconvenient or against the public trade. This argument was quashed by Lord Loughborough as nothing could be more essentially mischievous than the questions of property between A and B should ever be permitted to be decided upon considerations of public convenience. Instead, it appears that the public good had been displaced by the specification as the consideration on which the patent was granted. Although the legal records before the 1780s are sparse, it appears that the specification, particularly its accuracy, was an important issue in litigation. For example, in 1731, Trinity House, uh, the government body responsible for managing the nation's lighthouses, the Trinity House petitioned the Privy Council to revoke Robert Hamden's patent for distinguishing lights 
Significantly, Trinity House claimed that the specification was insufficient on the grounds that no method of actually distinguishing one light from another had been described by Hamlin. The Privy Council accepted this recommendation, annulling his patent, amongst other reasons, because he hath not performed the condition in the letter's patent whereby he is required to enrol a specification thereof. The instrument enrolled by him not ascertaining the nature of the invention. The issue also arose at common law ten years before Lyadette versus Johnson. In Yerbury versus Wallace in 1768, the patency lost because an accurate description of his invention was not given pursuant to his patent. Finally, it appears from contemporary writers that the accuracy of the specification was of legal significance. In 1774, William Kenrick observed that a secure patent was dependent on a precise mode of specification. It would be too much to claim that the specification was conceived as the contractual consideration of the patent from its introduction. However, the contractual conceptualization of the patent does have jurisprudential antecedents stretching back 50 years. Firstly, although the specification was introduced for a number of reasons, there was soon a clear demand for accurate and full descriptions of patents, which from the 1730s became mandatory. Secondly, the accuracy of these specifications was of legal importance long before 1778. <coughs> Thirdly, we've seen the disappearance of public good as a condition on which the patent was awarded and enforced. Uh, also, as a quick side note, um, on the other on the other important factor in early modern patents, the training of users as a means of dissemination. Uh, this has more or less disappeared at the start of the 18th century. Uh, there's, only one, there's only one case uh, regarding a petition, two petitions for a similar invention, where it's decided on this point, um, and that was in the 1710s. Um, and aside from that, it's, it's unimportant. But returning, sorry, returning to the specification as a contract, there is, there is no smoking gun, no definitive statement in the 1730s where the patent was conceived as a contract, where in return for their temporary monopoly, the patency had to provide a full description. It's also unlikely that there is one. Instead, these were developments that were occurring over a number of decades. For in the 1780s, however, when the court records do start to improve, this contractual conceptualization of the patent becomes ubiquitous in the legal literature and the court records. So here we have a few examples. Um, for example, in the first one in Turner versus Winter, Buller stated, the consideration which the patentee gives for his monopoly is the benefit which the public are to derive from his invention after the patent is expired, and that patent is secured to them by means of a specification of the invention. There are, however, two practical problems with arguing that specification was the condition on which the patent was awarded in both the 18th and 19th centuries. Firstly, if the legal status of the specification was so important, why did so many inventors enter misleading specifications, as is claimed by McLeod? If they knew that their patent would not be enforceable as a result of entering a deficient specification, surely they would endeavour to enter as full description as they could. Secondly, if the specification was intended to inform the public, why was it virtually withheld from them? As mentioned in the introduction, it is thought to have been prohibitively difficult for the public to access a specification in Chancery. This also introduces a wider problem with the operation of the English patent system during the Industrial Revolution. As mentioned before, MacLeod considers it to have been possible to work a patent invention in secret. If this were so, it would entirely undermine the rationale for awarding patents and would raise serious queries over the encouragement provided by patents to the development and diffusion of technology during the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> On the first problem of poor specifications, it suddenly appears that in the first few decades after the specification was introduced, misleading descriptions 
were sometimes submitted on purpose. Uh, for example, in 1760, one writer reported a conversation with a London chemist where he asked why the manner of making up and giving his remedy was not in the Chancery Office in a right method, whereupon he smiled and with great assurance told me, can you imagine we will ever pay near £80 for patent and set all the chemists in town to work? In chemicals and pharmaceuticals, however, patents were used more as a means of advertisement than for the purpose of actually protecting the invention in the mid-18th in the mid century. In other technological sectors, inventors were more diligent in their preparation for specification, and this was because of the legal emphasis placed on its accuracy. In 1769, so this is 10 years before Lyardet, in 1769, James Watt took great pains in preparing his specification for the separate condenser, uh, one of the most important inventions in the Industrial Revolution and a very significant development in steam engineering. Watt corresponded extensively on the matter of the specification, and his motivation was clear, writing, for example, to Dr. William Small, as I have been informed that some patents have been defeated because the specification was not clear enough to enable other people to execute the scheme, I have added descriptions of the machines with drawings. This was quite a logical response on the part of inventors to the specification requirement. It may be surprising to hear that it has been argued that the legal emphasis on the accuracy of the specification had the opposite effect, to encourage inventors to enter defective descriptions until at least 1830. This was apparently because it was thought to be so unlikely that a specification submitted to court would be deemed sufficient. And so inventors would enter in an intentionally elusive description without undermining their limited chances of success in litigation. This had the advantage of retaining to them an element of secrecy regarding the nature of their invention. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on the issue of alleged bias, um, but very briefly, Mackay bases the supposition partly on statistical work by Harold Dutton, who argued that between 1770 and 1830, patentees only won a third of court cases. Uh, I've done a little bit of statistical work myself, uh, which has included information on a lot more verdicts than used by Dutton. And it appears that patentees actually won about half the time. So, so, this, the, so the quantitative basis for this argument by McLeod uh, doesn't appear to exist. Okay, however... As was mentioned briefly at the beginning, technical drawings and descriptions remained rudimentary for much of the 18th century. It appears that some inventors were, were unsure on what information was necessary to complete a, a, a sufficient specification. Interestingly, in the preparation of his specification, James Watt thought he needed to be as concise as possible in his description, presumably for the sake of clarity rather than being entirely comprehensive. Again, he wrote to one correspondent, I shall be much obliged to you to sit in judgment upon it and shorter, shorter it as much as you can to keep the meaning plain. To remedy the situation, inventors began to invest large sums hiring professional assistants to ensure that their specifications were accurate. Uh, a little later in the 19th century, in his evidence to the 1829 Select Committee, the patent agent, Moses Paul, testified that he had known charges for preparing the specification to be as high as £200 and reckoned the average to be about £20. The work of James Harrison shows that from the last quarter of the 18th century, there are, there are a host of qualified technical advisors providing inventors with technical help in developing their invention and preparing their specification. Harrison quotes Samuel Moore, the Secretary to the Society of Arts from 1769 to 99, complaining, no man in the United Kingdom is so often consulted upon patents as I am, and who gets nothing by it. The use of professional draftsmen to assist in preparing the specification also militated against the deposit of intentionally misleading descriptions. Such professionals have no interest in concealment and would have been in danger of their reputations if the description later proved to be deficient in court. Uh, 
With the development of patent agents and technical consultants in the last quarter of the 18th century, it would have been the negligent inventor who unwittingly entered a faulty specification. And indeed, the judicial emphasis placed on the accuracy of the specification appears to have had precisely the effect intended, i.e. to oblige inventors to enter as full and precise a description of their invention as possible. Finally, the availability of these specifications has to be considered. As mentioned at the beginning, McLeod claims that specifications were virtually withheld from the public and that it was possible for patentees to work their invention in secret until reform in 1852. It would be strange, although contemporary government practice with regards to patents was beset by strange practices, but still, it would be strange that such emphasis would be placed on the specification, particularly its accuracy, but which was then hidden away inside a chancery. When completed, specifications could be deposited into one of three chancery offices, the petty bag, the enrolment office, or the rolls chapel. Conveniently, the three offices maintained indexes of the specifications entered in their offices. The public were free to consult them, and this made finding specifications much easier than is supposed by McLean. The public did have to pay fees to consult a specification, although these were cheap. Uh, at, the turn of the 18th, uh, at the turn of the 19th century, um, the fees in the Rolls Chapel and Enrolment Office, uh, they both charged a shilling to, to look at a specification, and the Petty Bag charged three shillings and sixpence. So these were, these were relatively modest charges. Uh, it was, though, expensive to obtain copies of specifications from these offices, especially on long ones with technical drawings. The clerk of the petty bag, Francis Abbott, stated that office copies could cost up to £40, which is a very considerable sum for the period, um, and was probably beyond the budget of all bar publishers and the most determined and resourced private individuals. Uh, it was also, also to protect their, their income from fees, uh, the clerks in these offices were on salary, the taking of extracts was forbidden, although consultations were allowed to continue over a number of days. Before 1820, the feeling amongst many inventors and manufacturers was that specifications were too readily available, especially for foreigners. In 1793, a bill was introduced to the House of Commons, which proposed to allow the filing of secret specifications as currently, such enrolment copies thereof may be obtained by foreign agents and emissaries and transmitted to foreign countries to the disadvantage of the trade of this kingdom. Although this bill was unsuccessful, uh, there was another attempt in 1820 to pass a similar bill, where it's proposed that copies of specifications could only be obtained when a party had entered an affidavit and motion in court. But again, this bill didn't become law. Accordingly, because the specifications were generally available, they were very often consulted, and despite the expense, copies were often ordered. In 1767, for example, the potter, Wedgwood, ordered, ordered a partner to obtain a copy of, of a specification, letting the cost be what it will. Later, in 1832, the patent agent William Cartmill wrote, it is constantly the practice as soon as a new and useful invention comes out for persons in the particular branch of trade to which it relates to get copies of the specification with a view to take opinions of scientific individuals acquainted, acquainted with the law to ascertain whether the specification is sufficient. Specifications were also often published in the 19th century. It is relatively straightforward to trace the publication of specifications thanks to the reference index. The index provides a reference to every specification published in contemporary technical literature. So very briefly, uh, this graph, I, I won't go into too much detail, but this graph shows the percentage of patent specifications that are either published once, twice, or at least three times for every year between 1795 and 1850. So for example, if you look at 1825, it shows that Virtually all specifications, well, 100% of specifications were printed 
uh, and about 70 to 80% were published twice, and between about a third were published three or more times. Uh, unfortunately, the reference index omits publications from the 18th century with which it would have been possible to <coughs> also trace the publication of earlier specifications. Specifications and descriptions of patent inventions did, however, find their way into print during the 18th century. The Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, the foremost scientific journal of the day, contained numerous descriptions of new inventions and improvements, many of which were patented. So, yep, so here, for example, is a plate published in the transactions for Walter Churchman's horse-powered pumping engine, patented in 1733. Um, I don't know how clearly you can see it from where you are, uh, but it, what's useful about it is it does, it does demonstrate some of the things I was talking about, technical drawing, uh, a little earlier. Um, uh, I mean, firstly, there's no scale, which you always have in technical drawings. And secondly, it has some rather strange ornamental features, which again, you would never see on technical drawings today. Unfortunately though, without trawling through all the contemporary scientific journals, it is impossible to be sure what proportion of patent inventions were published during the 18th century. The chances are though, is that it wasn't very large, certainly nothing like in the, in the earlier period, uh, in the later period say in the second quarter of the 19th century, where it's virtually all of them. That's very unlikely. And that's mainly because the book and publishing trade did remain relatively small until the last quarter of the 18th century. So then to, to sum up, uh, in, in perhaps a rather haphazard way, this paper has presented a, a partial revision to the current understanding of patents in the 18th century and the legal foundations on which it was based. I say haphazard partly because of the sources used. Uh, court records are a little bit sparse for the period, um, and instead they've had to be supplemented with material from law officer reports, papers of inventors, and parliamentary records. But also haphazard because there probably wasn't any sudden shift in the legal foundation of patents as allegedly heralded by Lydat versus Johnson. Instead, the picture that emerges is one where there was a gradual development in the state's specification, and by extension, the patent itself, beginning in about the 1710s, and suddenly finished by the 1780s, when the contractual conceptualization of the patent becomes widely accepted and invoked by the judiciary. At the same time, we see the disappearance of considerations of the public good, and a move away from the patent as simply a privilege. The second half of the paper looked briefly at one of the implications of this development, patents and the diffusion of technology. It showed that specifications were relatively easy for the public to consult and in the main diligently prepared. This reinforces the argument in the first half of the paper that the specification was an important document in the consideration in which the patent was awarded. Later in the 19th century we've seen that specifications were regularly published, debarring any attempt at secret work. Thank you very much.